Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and super intelligent shades of the color sky blue pink, you're all welcome here. It doesn't matter how you identify. Um, treat today, we have Dr. Abs. Dr. Abs is in the house. And um, obviously, therefore, we're going to talk about cardiovascular health, of course, because, you know, why not? And um, yeah, Abs is going to kind of lead and tell us a bit about the kind of questions he gets clinically and how he deals with that. And uh, then I'll ask any questions that come to mind or whatever. And yeah, that'll be us. So Abs, you're it. Thank you. First of all, it's it's amazing to be here. I think, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of the channel. I think it's brilliant. I think you put out great content. So thank you very well, much. Well, there's for your me credibility on. shot then, Abs. Goodness. <laughs> 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 uh, good. Uh, so I, you know, I treat people with, with a lot of complicated medical histories, different medical histories, and people with heart issues, they generally tend to ask the same thing. So... Today, I wanted to go through probably the most commonly asked things and see if we can translate some myths and, and put things in layman's terms for everyone. So, yeah. uh, and, and you know, I can I can sort of give my my thoughts and you can have a little discussion, I guess. Uh, one thing I had two days ago, which someone asked me was, what is the difference between a heart attack, in inverted commas, and a cardiac arrest? Hmm. Cool. All right, so... How would how would you go about answering that? I mean, I could give it a mic crack, so, but we're here to hear from you. Sure. So I I think the way I personally describe it is one is an, an absolute lack of oxygen. One is a blockage. Um, for example, you know, you get blood clots or something like that, and and the blockage results from buildup of something, uh, and then and the cardiac arrest on the other hand is more like an electrical system malfunction, and we we have. This isn't news to you, obviously, but we have little sort of microchips on the heart, the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node, and they and they send these sort of pulses out, which controls the differential rate of contraction on different parts of the myocardium. And a, and a dysfunction of that um, can lead to a cardiac arrest. Uh, how would you how would you put things? Yeah, pretty, pretty similar that that those two nodes are uh, pacemakers and they tell the myocardium, the muscle tissue of the heart uh, where it should be throughout the contractile cycle and thus keeps everything in rhythm and keeps the thing working it should be when those timings go off that's like a misfire in a motor i guess and that can lead to a stalling out a complete stoppage um yeah so pretty much that's it yep yeah um mm. and i think the lack of oxygen uh, I guess technically we could describe that as ischemia if you're mm. if you're being technical, if people read that in a paper and they don't know the difference. And that is very, very significantly going to disrupt the ATP production. And then that in turn leads to a whole host of sort of cataclysmic metabolic dysfunctions. Um, very significantly, even the sodium and potassium ATPase pumps, and then you get this instantaneous sort of acidosis. Uh, and then that in turn is one of the key factors, I would say, in leading to apoptosis, which is what you're then trying to heal from and, and get new cells back from in, in shall we say, the, the time immediately following that. Mm. Um, I don't know if you, you have anything to, to disagree with there or, or to, to no, add not, at all? No, not, not really at all. Um, just in terms of the other thing of, of making a differential diagnosis as well, I'll, I'll give you an example from the real world. The now late father of my now ex partner of many years ago had an event in town one day dropped on the spot you know the, mm. the ambulance was called and they got there when they got there as you know how these things go and he arrived at the hospital living he actually recovered from this by the way he died years yeah. later of some you know other thing which i don't know anything about the cause of because i'm no longer involved in that family but um, at that time, they were talking about the fact that he's had a heart attack, he's had a heart attack, he's had a heart attack. I kept on telling everyone in the family. And I was mm. the only one around the family that kind of had some training and had some ideas. And the first thing I said to the attending physician was, great, what was the creatinine? Or any other signs that there's any kind of myocardial damage that's gone on here? Well, they're normal. Okay, so he hasn't had a heart attack then, has he? Perhaps you better go back and have another look at what's going on. So here's me instructing the doctors what to do. 
So they did go back and have a look and found out that in actual fact, there was significant atherosclerosis and, and, and lesioning in other areas, which had caused such an occlusion of blood flow that his heart became ischemic, and that's what, or ischemic, if you like, and that's what caused it to stop. Not that there mm. had been a blockage. So that's another way of, of looking at the difference. If someone mm. has had an MI, yeah. then there are clinical signs, including an increase in the creatinine in the blood, for example. Yeah. So what do you, you go, think there, of uh go sorry, on. sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, go for it. Um what what do you I mean I've I've looked at certain experiments where people are are supplementing ribose specifically after an event like that to kind of aid the, the healing, but not given in too big a dose initially. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? Have you seen that before? I've heard of it being used. Um, in terms of the efficacy, I'm not sure I've seen any data set that I could tap that would say, yes, it's good or no, it isn't. Have you? Mm. No, I've I've seen the theory behind it. I think that they're basically trying to replenish ATP because the, the ribose can improve potentially. They're saying that the contractibility of the heart muscle mm. um, and they're saying that patients with chronic ischemic heart disease who get the ribose supplementation have reported how do I phrase it, sort of improved tolerance uh, to exercise and then mm. less fatigue symptoms and dyspnea symptoms um, during that exercise. But like you say, it, it's obviously not become widespread and I don't think that's uh, a coincidence mm. um, at all. But maybe it something would be, for the Yeah, future. it would be very, very interesting to see if we could tease out a, a mechanism by which ribose does that, if there was one that, mm. that's been proposed. Um, it might just be mechanistic that they're saying that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's even some kind of nucleotide salvage pathway. I don't know. Uh, well, where you're trying to get the nucleotides yeah. back into things. Yes. As soon as you start talking about ribose, then you're bringing in, you know, DNA and stuff. And there could exactly. well be, yeah, there could well be some, some linkage there. Fascinating. Yeah. Mm. Um, so the next FAQ, if I've written these down, um, what are some early warning signs of, for the, for the lay person to look for in terms of impending cardiovascular disease that they often overlook, would you say? Well, the first one for me, the most, um, and I'm loath to use the words risk factor because mm. risk implies mechanism, which means that you have controlled experimental research to underpin that mechanism, supposedly. We don't have that in human health. It's very, very hard, if not impossible, to get an ethics committee to say, okay, test these people and see what kills them. Ethics committees don't like that kind of stuff. And also, if you want to keep people in labs locked away under observation for decades at a time to see how their health progresses over decades, ethics committees yeah. and financial committees tend to look on that fairly unfavorably as well. So when people say we have all this science about human health, no, we don't. We have a bunch of theology about human health, but the science is pretty, pretty lacking. Um, so there is that. Remind, get me back on track. Abs, remind me of the question again because I'm I'm ranting now. <laughs> what is what are, what are some early warning signs of CBD that the lay oh yes warning look out signs for? you know risk factors okay so number one obesity yeah that's that's a fairly clear sign that there is chronic systemic inflammation at least poor diet almost certainly lack of physical activity almost certainly but not universally. Um, so someone who is over the, uh, and it, this is not a threshold thing either, by the way. The other thing mm. the medical profession does is they threshold everything. This is okay. Yeah. One point higher than that is not okay anymore suddenly. There's no gray in here. It's black and white. Well, that's just daft. But anyway, a person who is obese, that's a problem probably, or heart disease yeah. risk or likelihood or incidence in a population. Does being obese affect your risk? We can't establish that. Because the only way to do that is to test it over decades and see what happens. Um, as, a, as a population, we know that there is a higher incidence of heart disease if you're carrying way too much body fat. So there's that. Any other sequelae signs, symptoms, or whatever of a chronic systemic inflammatory overburden? For me, big time. So if you're someone who has 
well, psoriasis or a rheumatic situation or some other specific or non-specific complex or simple immune deficiency or immune overactive, sorry, immune overactivation issue. I mm. think that's important. Hypertension. Yeah, as, no, as we I talked about in that mechanistic video with with heart disease yeah. that that I did a bit back, um, hypertension absolutely because that leads to turbulent blood flow in the high pressure side of the vasculature, and it's these points of turbulence where the lesions develop. So that's absolutely deterministically a cause and effect risk factor. Mm. That's one we can point to and say there it is, because they because the lesions develop predictably in those zones. It must be a causal thing because the only thing different between the blood here and the blood right next to it is the turbulent flow here where the lesion is. So that's got to be causal. I think that's massively important. Um, angina should not be ignored. Mm, as a, chest as pain, a, shortness of breath. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in terms of acute, you're having an MI right now, probably signs and symptoms. Well, you've got tingling up the left-hand side of your jaw. You've got pain in the left arm or shoulder. You've got a crushing vice-like pain in the chest. You've got an ashen pallor. You've got a raised um, respiration rate, but lowered depth. You've got an increase or decrease in the sinus rhythm of the, of the heart. And also you've got arrhythmias that go on during an MI as well. Um, other signs and symptoms of an MI, of course, are loss of consciousness and potentially the death. The obvious ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Think... So longer term stuff, we've got too much weight on your body. We've got turbulent blood flow. We've got hypertension. We've got um, glycation damage, too much sugar. Um. I think they're the real big ones for me. Yeah. I think on a biochemical level, um, nitric oxide is probably going to be very, very important to look at. But I'm I'm personally not aware of testing nitric oxide ability or, or ENOS ability. Are you aware of any tests that the average person can do to, to have a look at that? Or are we relying on, on the kind of markers that we've just mentioned? I think the difficulty for the average person on the street is that they are behooven to whatever health arrangements there are in their country of residence. And mm -hmm. that kind of, here are the tests that physicians are typically using for things. And if you want something off piste there, either you can't get it, they won't do it, mm -hmm. or you've yeah. got to pay for it yourself or both. You can't get it, and even if you could, you'd have to pay for it, and it costs this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. Most of these technical things that are done in research labs are not done, typically, in day-to-day -day healthcare. Yeah. I mean, even when you look at uh, – I've seen people comment in, in different videos and things and talking about the fact that they would like to go and get a CAC scan, and, and I understand the logic behind that, mm -hmm. but people don't seem to realize there's – you know, as a medical professional, you have to go through justification, limitation, and optimization whenever you order a scan. Mm. And the justification to just willy-nilly order a CAT scan, which is a very high dose of radiation, mm. unfortunately, it's, it's just not worth it. Um, and, I, and I don't think people should want to go and do those type of scans, even though I've had requests personally for things mm. like that as well. Yep. Um, I don't know if you, you would say there's a lower radiation dose alternative to a CAC scan that you've heard of that I, that I don't know of at all? Well, I mean, people are using like ultrasound to get a gauge mm. on soft tissue lesioning. And in fact, often if someone is going to have a CAC, I would say to them, well, you might as well get ultrasound done at the same time or a similar time mm. because the CAC actually won't pick up soft tissue plaque, only the calcified plaque. That's the whole point. Mm. It's mineralized um, enough to hold on to the radiation and to block exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the reds really can be an issue. Even okay, Texas okay. scan, actually, there is an there is an element of radiation. Mm. It's small, but it's still there. It's not something you do every couple of months for no good reason. I think. No, exactly. I agree entirely. I'm I'm um, against testing for the sake of testing. Actually, 
on all mm. aspects of health. Like people say, what blood should I get? I say, well, what are your symptoms? Yeah, yeah. I agree. What symptomology are you suffering? Why would you believe your health to be compromised in any way at this time? Well, I don't know. I just, you know, I just want some peace of mind. I just want to, you know, yeah. so what what broad range of blood tests should I get? And I say, well, you shouldn't get any because that'll probably actually lead you up the garden path. Mm. There's a psychological side to that, I think, mm. which which is always going on. And, and people who are so obsessed with looking at these levels, I mean, they're going to induce their own issue at some yeah. point, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, a form of orthorexia, uh, I think. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. People be, people used to calm down, is what we're saying. Yes. Calm down, people. <laughs> Trust us. We're the science. We're safe and effective. That's what we're saying. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, question the science. So, mm. the, the next question I've got is uh, one relatively commonly asked for me. It's how does high blood pressure specifically affect the myocardium as opposed to the actual vessels? going yep. around because we know the aorta obviously isn't the most pressure but what about the actual heart itself yes okay it seems to me that in terms of the dynamics of the whole situation that almost inevitably the underlying cause of hypertension is in the back pressure in the diastolic pressure the systolic pressure obviously will come up because it has to be higher to overcome that diastolic back pressure of the vascular tree. And as such, when you have poor vascular tone, poor nitric oxide production, um, calcification, advanced atherosclerosis, soft tissue lesioning to some extent, which affects the elasticity and reactivity and all of that, of that system. Um, someone who is chronically, psychologically in a state, stress, distress, whatever, that can do it. Someone that's swimming in cortisol will do it. But... All of those things aside, all valid things, absolutely. But for me, if I looked at 100 individuals at random and said, right, what's the situation here? Probably 99 of those people are going to be people with chronically elevated insulin. Chronically elevated insulin is a response to toxic levels of contraindicated unnecessary carbohydrates in the diet. One of the side effects of chronically elevated insulin is that the renal tissue is unable to as effectively excrete sodium. Thus it pulls. Thus the renin angiotensin system is activated, etc., and we have this chronically elevated blood pressure situation from there because we have an increased central venous pool. Thus, we have more stretch in the period between the diastole and the systole. Thus, we have increased contractility. And it's that that drives the pressure for most people. So if you've got a combination of elevated insulin and elevated back pressure due to the damage and non-compliance and nitric oxide and all the things I mentioned before, that is a shitstorm waiting to happen for me. Mm. It's almost like a downward spiral. I describe yeah. it as my as my pain. It's like a vicious circle. And I think mm. even the hypertrophy alone of the myocardium can contribute towards failure or push you towards failure because it's not designed to be that big. Exactly. Um, yeah. that, and I think another thing that makes it a, a vicious circle is the oxidative stress, the the inflammation that's going on. Mm. And like you said, the RAA system is going to overactivate, get more and more angiotensin 2. You're going to get, in turn from that, exactly as you said, more vasoconstriction, which then is what we started with, higher, mm. higher pressure. And so it just gets worse and worse. So I would always say it's even if you have the earliest sign, it's not a sign to leave. It's a sign to change now. Mm. before it gets it's worse and worse um yeah so absolutely yep 
here's an interesting one. How how would you how would you describe the the difference between how diabetes type one and type two differently influence the likelihood or, or risk for want of a better word of cardiovascular disease? Yeah. So we mentioned elevated, chronically elevated insulin as being an issue with regard to the sodium retention, the central venous pool, the driving pressure, the all of those things that affect how the myocardium and the vascular tree work. In the case of type 1 diabetes, both diseases are ostensibly diseases of insulin. Mm-hmm. The case of type 1 diabetes, as opposed to too much insulin, the problem is insufficiency. Yeah. The other problem with type 1 diabetics is that they are told by the powers that be, the experts, that what they ought to do is base their diet around 65% complex carbohydrates, avoid all that saturated fat and red meat and stuff, and cover that with insulin exogenous insulin. That sets a person up absolutely for, again, an adiposity. Now, not all type 1 diabetics are fat. I'm not saying all of them are. But, you know, proportionally, a large number of type 1 diabetics end up with excess adiposity. What that does is that requires that adipose tissue to be um subserved by a network of capillaries or if you're an american Almost like hypoxia ca- capillaries if you're an american <laughs> what how do they say it capillaries that's how yeah, they say it. That's it. capillaries is what they are the, the the very smallest of the of the of the vessels that subserve the the fat tissue so that we can deliver fat to that tissue and get fat out of that tissue if we ever stop with this cycle of, you know, carbs and insulin, carbs and insulin, carbs and insulin. The 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 capillaries, capillaries, are often <laughs> just wide enough for a single red blood cell. They're very, very fine. And as such, they exert back pressure like you wouldn't believe. So if you if you take the the resting blood pressure of a person who is adipose, a person who is obese, versus their matched, controlled, genetically identical twin who is not, you're going to find a huge difference. The fat one's going to have a higher blood pressure, which is going to predispose them to higher amounts of turbulent flow in those areas where turbulent flow occurs. And it's that which is going to lead to the disease process of atherosclerosis. So it's kind of the same thing, but different. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think type two, um, I don't know whether you would agree or not, but I think type two, possibly you could say there's a, a more or a quicker risk of vascular permeability and fibrosis potentially as well, because the you know that type w- w- with the oxidative stress and the inflammation that we have, uh, which yeah, obviously, naturally, is the the damage to the intima, the, the endothelial layer. Mm. Um, we've got the activation of the protein kinase C pathway, mm. and then we get more VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and then we get more TGF beta, transforming growth factor beta, mm-hmm. and that directly is is responsible for the fibrotic tissue because even in dermatology, um, you know, sometimes I will try to induce TGF beta actually with certain types of trauma to the skin to break down fibro- fibrotic tissue in the skin. And I see a parallel between that and what's happening in, in type two diabetes. Um, I don't know if you, if you agree with me on, on, on that at all. Yeah, it's perfectly feasible from what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. So here's one sticking to the theme of obesity. Mm-hmm. How would you say sleep apnea specifically can contribute to CVD? Well, I guess that if nothing else, when you're having episodes of apnea, that is likely to lead to less than 100% saturation with oxygen. 
during that period of time to which there's going to be a cascade of events. Now, what we do know is if your tissues are not fully perfused with oxygen, that mm -hmm. will absolutely drop the ATP resources in every cell that's affected by that. Thus, the cytosolic concentration of inorganic phosphate will increase cause and effect. And what do we know about most pro-inflammatory cytokines? Oh, yes, they're they love inorganic phosphate. They yeah. love it. They're activated by AMP kinase, aren't they? Most of them. Yeah. So there you go. I think the, I think the intermittent hypoxia as well is is going to be a big big trigger. Um, like you say, the, but but exactly like you said, but actually specifically more in terms of the sympathetic nervous system as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. um, and then that in turn is is another I would say cause and effect for things like vasoconstriction and inflammation. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the reason I've, I find this quite interesting is because when we, when we look at what happens here in terms of the gene pathway of HIF1 alpha, um, I find that, you know, HIF1 alpha is implicated in something like this, where we get the expression, like you say, of pro-inflammatory cytokines, adhesion molecules, endothelial dysfunction, mm -hmm. but it, it's an interesting molecule because when you have HIF1 alpha in a different context, for example, in hypoxia training, when a runner goes to the Atacama desert to train, you get all these sort of wonderful elite sport improvements, which, you know, that's different to health. Yeah. Um, but you get all this as well. And, and I find it fascinating how the exact same gene pathway can be linked to something which is actually quite harmful, but then something which improves your, your ability to compete in sport. Um, do you, have you ever seen the usage of hypoxia training, um, training in inverted commas there, mm -hmm for not the context of elite sport, but for health. My poxia for health, that's an interesting one. Absolutely for for um, athletic performance, yes. In, in yeah. a previous life as an exercise physiologist before I was a nutritionist, before I was a cardiovascular pathophysiologist, etc. But I'm trying to think of a, whether or not I've ever seen it used for a health purpose. I don't it's all, I, I see I see almost like a version of hormetic stress. Makes sense um, to some degree. Yeah, but I don't know whether it's too too far outside the realms of normal physiology to be considered useful, mm. actually properly day-to-day -day useful for health. But it, you know, it's it's something I'm interested in anyway. Um, but like I said, you know, I, I think we both agree that in sport it can be useful. Yeah. However, I think uh, we also <clears> both <throat> agree that being fit for sport doesn't mean you yeah. are more healthy different. than the next person. What you are is fit for sport. Yeah. Health is not fitness and fitness is not health. They are separate things. And fitness yeah. to a certain level in certain specific fitness capacities is indicated and useful to a person at large. And beyond that, it becomes actually a detriment to one's life. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Mm. It's a, I mean, when, when an athlete, let's say they, they do altitude training, which which we can also call hypoxia training mm. and they get that increased cardiac capacity mm. they they perform better in their sport but then they finish their sport do you, obviously that is an adaptation which is increasing heart capacity and yeah. increasing the oxygenation around the body which is a positive benefit mm -hmm. if they stop the sport does the body give up the adaptation easily or very slowly. Right. There is a detraining or expected detraining curve on any physiological aspect, which differs awesome. from aspect to aspect. In terms of the number of red cells, that can change quite quickly within 24, 48 hours, up or down. Well, up certainly within 24 to 48 hours down might be a bit slower because you've got to break them down mm. um i don't think you're going to get a chronically elevated red count i.e a thickening up of your blood so yeah you'd, you'd return to baseline and probably fairly quickly in terms of red cells i would surmise okay without yeah. being able to tap a data set that says this is the answer yeah. Mm. Um, cool. So the next one, uh, I had a patient with lots of immune problems mm -hmm. and also heart disease. This was a couple of months ago. Yeah. And he asked me, 
how does um what what is the significance on a lowered immunity in heart disease because he couldn't understand that you know well it, from his perspective immunity is about fighting bacteria and foreign pathogens that come into your body mm. but heart disease you know you don't get atherosclerosis because you've cut yourself full over in some mud and some bacteria have gone in mm -hmm. so he couldn't understand why immunity plays a role in that as well i wonder if you could just laymanize that for him okay well at least one mechanism that i'm aware of in terms of that would be in a protein called fibrin which is extant in your plasma as fibrinogen i think it's called yeah which, which is a fluid and that's fine soluble, it's part of, yeah. yeah it's it's soluble it's a fluid it's part of your blood plasma it, it bops around with your blood no problem if you have an inflammatory response in your body one of the first things that happens is a cascade of, of events leading to that fibrinogen precipitating out of the plasma, dropping out in the form of fibrin, which is like the spider webby or, or cotton wool type mm. substance which blocks up your microvasculature. And that's why with does, thrombin, I think, right? Yeah. So why does that happen? Well, it happens in order to prevent any potential invading pathogens from moving around your body. We're going to lock this down. So it's an indicated response that has evolved over many, many millions of years. It's supposed to happen really and occasionally if there is the likelihood of a genuine problem. Unfortunately, many of us live lifestyles now that are so pro-inflammatory that we have an, an amount of fibrin mm. now microvasculature all the time that just never gets cleared away. And as such, these are the people with idiopathic hypertension because they're not fat. Maybe the insulin isn't elevated, but still we've got this blood pressure issue. And um, to my mind, that's the first thing I'd look at differentially to see if I could eliminate that as a possibility. Mm. So you, it, you, you, there are various things that you can give a patient to dissolve fibrin and see if that fixes the blood pressure issue and the inflammation issue. Yeah. Mm. I think people often don't realize as well that immune cells are required, you know, it, when, when you've got chronic inflammation uh, and, and you're looking at atherosclerosis, the recruitment of immune cells to the arterial lining is part of that process. Where, and that's how you get the cytokines to the, the growth mm. factors, all these sorts of things, the, the plaque formation, the instability. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a problem with Im your immune system, you've got a problem with trying to control your entire cardiovascular health, essentially, mm. because it's it's part of it's it's a central mechanism of trying to regulate everything. Um and and then eventually, you know, you you know you're gonna have activation if you've got that chronic inflammation of things like nuclear factor kappa b pathways mm -hmm. um interleukins tnf alphas all these sorts of things um so i think people often forget that the immune system even though it's for fighting pathogens foreign pathogens it's not just for that it's also a prophylactic almost in situations mm. like that um would it be fair to, to describe it as a prophylactic do you think yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, that's at, at the level of the development of the lesions, yes. Yeah. The, the immune yeah. cells play a role in that. Absolutely, they do. Yeah. So you've you've got macrophages that are trafficked to that damaged tissue. They will mm. phagocytize anything there that's not needed there at that time. Maybe there are LDL particles that are being sequestered there by the proteoglycans that are activated by the tissue damage at the site of the lesion. And maybe they've been drained of their cholesterol. The cholesterol's been delivered, yes, but mm -hmm. the the damaged tissue is not healing, not releasing that um, LDL to be recirculated. And as such, it will sit there and it will glycate, it will oxidize or both, and then it will become deranged. Thus, the immune system will no longer recognize it as native BAM. Absolutely. What this is a question for me now. When you have the endothelial progenitor cells in the bloodstream, so for those watching this who who don't understand what they are, it's almost like a kind of non-differentiated cell. 
mm -hmm. and that can become a couple of different things. Yeah. What kind, and during the process of atherosclerosis, what is it that recruits that progenitor cell to turn into, say, a, a white blood cell? Right. Okay. The exact mechanisms that determine what these cells differentiate into is still somewhat apocryphal. Okay. There is an amount of research that says this, that, and the other thing. Okay, fine. What we know is the, the cells you're talking about there, Abs, are, are a line of cells. Mostly they are CD34 plus adult yeah. stem cells. Which is why you're the one to ask. Right, exactly. Now, CD34, <laughs> CD34 plus adult stem cells reside in the long bones in the bone marrow. You have a population of these which are permanently bound to the bone marrow. They can't be released. These are your master adult stem cells. When the bone marrow receives a specific chemical signal that it's time to release a bolus of these cells for whatever reason, what happens is the master cell, which is locked to the bone marrow, will undergo a cell division. So you've now got two, and there's a protein strand between the two. The chemical signal for the release is some ligator of some kind. An L-selectin ligator, because that protein is called L-selectin, if you want to know. That releases the adult stem cell to the bloodstream, and it then bops around in the bloodstream until some chemical message is received by that cell telling it what it needs to be next. So the most common fates for CD34 adult stem cells are they become red cells, white cells, platelets, and immune cells. If they don't become any of those, then they can become absolutely any other cell in your body, with the exception of gametes. Mm -hmm. I don't feel so bad that I don't know the exact mechanism now. If yeah. if no one knows, no, I don't. I don't <laughs> think it is. I don't think it is known. I think there is like yeah. here are some hypotheses around it. Yeah. What we do know is that the cell is interpreting chemical messages it's receiving. And that's what seems to be the thing that determines what the CD34 mm. cell is going to do. Yeah, a patient asked me that once, and I, and I said, I, I honestly don't know. I've got no mm. idea. And then I said, why are you interested? And he said, well, if if we know that, why don't we just take a pill that forces that to happen? And I think that's extremely dangerous. And I, mm. and I think people should not aim for that because your body knows from four and a half million years of trial and error what needs to differentiate into what at what point. Yeah. You start shifting those ratios you're going to cause more harm than good mm. um, is, is my opinion anyway yeah quite potentially so absolutely yeah. i think um, that's as as distinct from taking something that would cause a higher release of the cells in the first place i think that's a different story yeah 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 obviously and, and I'm, in, I'm, invo to... I'm, I'm involved yes. in marketing a product that does exactly <laughs> that and it's universally you know a, a positive thing it seems for people to have yeah. a, a larger amount of these stem cells circulating at any given time. Mm. But even, I, I even agree actually with you, dermatologically. So, yeah. Yeah. But I don't um, think mess with them. No, no, once, definitely once, not. Once even released, if you look at the skin. Do their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Agree. Mm. Uh, and when you have more stem cells, even in other contexts, like for example, towards the basement membrane at the dermo epidermal junction in the skin, and you have a higher number of keratinocytes. I don't think there's any paper in the world that shows a lower quality of skin in any metric you wish when you've got a high number of those. Mm. Um, so I think I think that's a universal thing. Mm. Um, so I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, so the next one I wrote down was what genetic things, so things which people had no hand in, mm. can increase the, again, for want of a better word, risk mm -hmm. of uh, developing CVD. Okay. Well, I think a propensity for adiposity, which there is a genetic link, absolutely. A lot of people yep. say, oh, fatness runs in my family, which is true. Yeah. Which is true, absolutely. But you tell you what else runs in families, behavior. Mm. And eating Diet. the same thing. Diet runs in families as well. So yeah. it's out there. But you know, certainly we could suggest that some people are genetically more predisposed to carry a higher level of adiposity than others that will affect their blood pressure, that will affect the turbulence, that will affect their risk or likelihood throughout the lifespan of a cardiac 
disease problem. So there's one. Um, a person who is taller. Oh, I didn't know that. That's a new one well, for me. Hyd hydrostatic fluid column height. Right. A person who is taller will have a higher resting blood pressure in, yeah, the, orthost true. in the orthostatic posture, that is, yeah. than a person who is otherwise identical but a foot shorter in height. For example, so that's that's an important one. Um, a propensity towards, or an, or, or you know, someone who who does express more immune dysfunction. You bet. Yeah, agree. Absolutely. Any congenital malformation of the heart tissue itself can be an issue. I'll give you an example from a close family member. It happens to me and my older brother, 18 months older than myself, nearly came to his end a few years ago because he had a congenitally malformed tricuspid. Nobody knew about right. it through his whole life. And the whole time it had been affecting his aorta. And what actually occurred is it got to the point where he had several hemorrhagic strokes which we couldn't explain what the hell was going on here. Um, and it was only when he had a severe turn, lost consciousness altogether, et cetera, and an ambulance was called, et cetera, that they took him in and started having a look. And it turned out that his aorta was so distended that they were saying, like, this is going to rupture any minute sort of thing. And so now he's got a Gore-Tex aorta with an artificial valve. So, you know, that can be an issue. Mm. Do you think familial hypercholesterolemia no. is something that people need to worry about? Yep. Nope, okay. not at all. Cholesterol does not cause heart Agreed. disease, yep. neither does lipoproteins, neither does any of the lipoproteins like APOB or LP mm. little a. None of those things are causal artifacts in heart disease. In fact, L just, I find that funny because LDL and LP little a are almost identical mm. structurally. One's mm. just kind of got a necklace around it yeah. um, of APO A, I think, mm. and that's it. Yeah, <laughs> and mm. I don't think people realise they're almost identical. That's they're right, exactly the same. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting because Peter Rattier always talks about APO B. All right, and you mean, you mean um, one, of, one of the biggest reductionists going around? Peter yeah, Rattier. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I and I just I've never understood his reasoning for that. Um, if I'm not mis <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because if I'm not mistaken, he is currently in a lawsuit. Is he? Um, okay. yeah, because he was not paid the amount he was promised for promoting certain things. Okay. And during the lawsuit, it's come out that whenever, you know, there are times, this is alleged just to cover myself. Allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, yeah allegedly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There was, you know, someone uh, showed a, a screenshot of an email saying, can you say something good about this? And then they showed a screenshot of a tweet of him saying, I can't remember what the product was, but this is really good and it's something I can't live without. Mm -hmm. And I just think, how can you trust someone, you know, who goes around promoting things along like that? Uh, it's, mm. it's, it's, yeah, astonishing. Yeah, so Peter Rattier has had a successful publishing career as an academic. Yeah. Um, but that actually doesn't confer veracity or correctness on your research program. It just mm. means that you've been good at playing the game of getting things published. Yeah. And I've used the term reductionist to describe it here. And for those who don't understand what that is, it's the habit of picking up a cog off a table, not knowing where it comes from or what it is, mm. looking at that cog, and on the basis of looking at that cog, suggesting you know all about that gearbox let alone all about the car that the gearbox came from. Mm, like don't. most mitochondrial pathways. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely correct. So yeah. I wouldn't trust Peter Attia as far as I can throw him, would be mm. the uh, the take home on Peter Attia. And yeah. anyone, anyone at all that tells you that cholesterol causes heart disease or LDL causes heart disease or that there's this mythical thing that exists called LDL cholesterol, which doesn't exist, that that causes yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> or that LP little A causes it, or that APOB causes it, or whatever. 
none of these people are people who you can scientifically trust to give you mm. valid, robust information of a scientific nature. They are all theologues, every one of them. And every one mm. of them is underpinned by that in some way or another. Most of them don't even realize that LDL is not cholesterol. Correct. We call it LDL cholesterol, but LDL is a lipoprotein that contains cholesterol because Correct. that's the package it's delivering. That's right. And, it, you know, I, I find it astonishing how many people don't actually realize that. Mm. Good um, and bad cholesterol, they say. Yeah. But what they're talking yeah. about is two different lipoproteins that carry the self same identical cholesterol. It's nothing yep. to do with cholesterol. It's to do with their belief that one of those lipoproteins that carries the cholesterol is good and the other one is yeah. bad. Well, here's the thing. Both those lipoproteins are encoded for by a length of DNA that has survived at least 13,800 million years. It's there for a yep. reason. It has a role to play. It's not bad. It's just nonsense. Theological nonsense underpinned by money. Who's money? Well, it's the companies that make the drugs that reduce the Big cholesterol. Pharma. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, what, that, what do you think about people that talk, um, that, that are kind of in between what we've said and what Peter says, who say, yeah, you shouldn't really worry about cholesterol. Um, it's not the cause, but you should pay some statistical attention to triglycerides to HDL ratio. What do you think of those things? I mean, triglyceridemia, obviously that is an issue. Yeah. Um, might be fructose or something like that, whatever in the diet. Hmm. But what do you think of that specific ratio? Do you think that has any merit for the well, average person to pay any attention to? I think it's I think it's really interesting because the only thing I can tap, the only data set at all that I can tap is a study that was a prospective, they called it prospective study. It's actually retrospective, not prospective. This is what happened in those people. Those people at that time. Anyway, mm. what did the study do? They looked at 134,000 patients in a hospital setting. This is all stateside, by the way. Okay. Various American hospitals. And these are patients who in the last 24 hours have had an MI. Right? And what they've done is they've looked at these people's total cholesterol, mm. their HDL, yeah, their LDL, and their triglycerides within 24 hours. I have a hours. guess what it showed? Go on. I'm guessing it's a normal distribution. Correct, it is. It's a bell-shaped curve. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> for every one of those metrics, <laughs> each of them. Now, if any one of those things are causal in heart disease, then we wouldn't get a bell-shaped curve. We'd get a straight line. Yeah. But the higher that thing is, the more times it's represented in, in that bucket or that pool of different levels of whatever the signal is. Yeah. We don't get that. We get a normal distribution curve. Ergo, yeah. none of those things are the cause. None of those things are responded to dose response. I think we can dismiss it. Yeah. And he, even if you look at mortality curves, mm. the, the the best results actually I would slight I, I don't know the exact number. It's going to be somewhere probably about I don't know, 220, something like that. You 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 get the high, the best statistics. Yeah. Exactly 220. And, and, <clears throat> oh, is it 220 exactly? Okay, yeah. that was actually a guess for me. Oh, there you go. It's a good guess. <laughs> and then when you go even higher than that yes it tails away but it doesn't tail away as much and i suspect and again it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts when it does tail away as you go past 220 mm. i don't think there's a causality in the ldl going up i think there's something else happening mm. and that is actually why you've got a, a different uh, expectancy of mortality beyond 220 um yeah. would, would, you, would you agree well the data set that I can tap on that one is, again, a prospective data set because you can't lock people in labs for 50 years to see what happens. Mm -hmm. All we can do is look at what we can look at and go, okay, let's see how this pans out across a large number of people. So the data I'm talking about is actually two independently collected data sets, which we can graph X versus Y. And... Yeah. The agency that collected this data, well, there are two agencies. One was the British Heart Foundation. Yeah. And, and the other one was was that one, who, 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 who are you? I don't know who they are, and I don't want to. Those people. Yeah. Um, and the who, who, who are you, those people, looked at the um, rate of mortality in 168 countries and territories around the world. And they've done an age adjustment. Okay, they've done an age adjustment for mortality. Fair enough, because we know that age and 
rates of mortality are absolutely collinear, so fine. I'm, that's not a problem for me. And on the x-axis, the BHF have taken cholesterol readings, LDL readings, non-LDL, all that stuff in yeah. the same 168 countries and territories. We're, we're looking at a data set that is several billion person years. So it's a huge perspective data set. Yeah. Here's what we find. If a person's total cholesterol is 220 milligrams per deciliter, that is associated with the nadir point, the lowest incidence of mortality from all causes and also from every major subcause, cardiovascular disease, cancer, yeah, diabetes related sequelae, etc., all of them all minimized at exactly 220 milligrams per deciliter. For every reduction in total cholesterol yeah. below that level, there is a quite precipitous increase in all-cause mortality and every sub-cause as well, mm -hmm. strangely enough. And then above 220, there's this slight kind of upward J-shaped yeah. curve that suggests to the uneducated reader that above 220, now suddenly it's a problem. Below 220, it's a problem. Yeah. And above 220, it's a problem because the nadir point, the lowest point is 220. Makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense because it fails to understand that the number of data points above 220 is vastly less than any number of data points below 220. And as such, what we're looking at is the best mathematical fit for that data set across its entire range, which does end up being a function that has a, a, one of those shapes. I'll put it on yeah. the screen. When, when I'm doing the editing of this, I'll put this chart up mm. on the screen so people can see what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. That's a statistical thing. Yeah. It's not a cause and effect relationship, I would, I would suggest. Yeah. Any more than we can claim that having your cholesterol below 220 is the cause of mortality. Yeah. Because this is an associative data set. But I'll tell you what, people that tell you that having higher cholesterol is a, is a significant risk factor above 70 and you should keep it below 70. Well, if you have LDL below 70, then your total cholesterol <laughs> is probably 130 to 150. Give or take. And that's mm. well below the 220 and the precipitous increase in mortality of that line would suggest in 168 countries and territories with several billion person years of follow up that that's not associated with good outcomes at all in fact mm. and then we go to the underpinning logic that says well okay what does cholesterol do in the body and what would be some of the ramifications of it being too low yeah huge yeah. If, if you're if you're a child Mm. And you you have a disorder, I forgot what it's called now. It's got like four letters. It's an acronym mm. um, where you have excessively low amounts of cholesterol. Um, you are talking about malformed limbs. Mm. You're talking about severe mental retardation mm -hmm. and extremely shortened lifespan. Right. Are we talking and, like and the vegan level retard retardation? <laughs> 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 or are we talking? Or are we talking the level of retardation suffered by someone like James de Nicolantonio? Because that's a different style oh, of retardation again. Possibly. <laughs> There's a paper that absolutely proves Bart K. wrong. He says a paper with no data in it, not a single data. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So low cholesterol, really bad. Also, if you take people with double knockout LDL receptors, yeah. They're about a one in one million prevalence at birth. These folks don't generally make it to teenage. And it's not because yeah. they have hugely, vastly, grossly elevated blood cholesterol. That's got nothing to do with the reason they died. They died because their cells are starving of cholesterol because they don't have the receptor. You can't make cells Oof. if you don't have the cholesterol. That's literally That's what they're made of. Yeah. Even the brain, you know, no, no surprise when you have severely low levels of cholesterol as a child you you don't you you basically have no brain like as good as mm. because it's made of it uh and it goes to show the importance of uh animal protein you can't get dha from plant food no because the 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 electrical properties of dha when it when it's combined in in a sort of makeshift electrical circuit is just not needed for plants because there's no nervous system 
Mm. Uh, and that fact alone, for me, that's one of my favorite facts that kind of shows the abhorrence of veganism. The fact that our brain is made of something which you cannot get from plants mm. tells you we would not have evolved to what we are if we were meant to be plant-based. Mm. And and then they say, well, you just take a supplement. I, I don't, what are your thoughts? I, I don't think the supplement has the same bioavailability. I don't think it yields exactly the same effects because when we get the DHA from food, mm. we're also getting so many other things. Like that animal fat yeah. is going to have things like, for example, vitamin K2. Yeah. It's going to have choline. Yeah. It's going to have other minerals. Yeah. You, you can't replace that with a supplement. Absolutely. I think that's valid. And I would also add another point. Yeah. But if you go to a journal called Nutrition, yeah, and I think it's the year of 2016 it might have been published, I'm not sure. There's a paper by a very, very intelligent and attractive young Swedish scientist called Pim Jansson. And some other I think board, I know the study. Right, and some other bald guy she was working with in that study for some reason. I don't know why she was working with him, but she was. Charity. That's, yeah, well, perhaps it was. Perhaps it was. And, and, you know, such things continue on a daily basis. But anyway, she did a study whereby nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy was used to assess the level of very, very highly toxic primary oxidation products of omega-3 supplements. And I think it was 12 supplements from memory that were tested available over the counter what we were both living in the uk at the time yeah what the procedure was was to walk into x number of pharmacies over there and ask the sales staff which brand of omega-3 they would suggest as being a good one a reputable one the one that a person should buy and got them according to those instructions so all well-known brands respected brands whatever 12 of them tested for aldehydes now aldehydes are a oxidation product of various types of fats including omega-3s and they can destroy lipid rafts so cell membranes that's not so good they can bind to and even ligate dna molecules so that's a problem mm. Very, very obviously. They can outright kill various cell organelles on the spot, pretty much. They can cause apoptosis, carcinogenesis, metastases, all sorts of problems. Omega-3 supplements, well, two-thirds of them that we tested were tainted wow. with aldehydes, and there is no safe limit for aldehydes. In mm. micro doses, they can, excuse my language, they can fuck your shit up. Yeah. Very, very seriously. Yeah, so I, I, agree. I, for one, would not touch an omega-3 supplement bought across the counter for yeah. that reason alone. And I think just for operational definition for those watching, if they go and read that paper or other papers, mm. I think it's important to realize when you're talking in the context of lipids, the term oxidation can sometimes be a bit confusing. Because when we're burning the fatty acids, we are oxidizing things. But when we're talking about things like this, we we are really talking about lipid peroxidation, yes, which is slightly different. So if you see the term oxidation, you just look out for the difference between oxidation and peroxidation. If you're yeah. looking at those papers, yeah. quite right, quite right too. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably all we've got time for today, isn't it? Brilliant. It is. We should do this again, and we I should. also think we should have you on live for Q and A. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome yeah. for answering questions and answers and things. Um, in the meantime, remind us of your social medias. Where can people find you? How can they support what you're doing? All of that. Of course, uh, my channel is Dr. Abs. Um, it's uh, also on Instagram. Or my, I am also on Instagram, Dr. Abs. My Instagram is pretty boring. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't use it too much. Uh, but YouTube is where everything is. There you go. There it is. So Dr. Abs, who is in private practice in the UK, um, that's where his social medias are. That's how you support what he's doing. Go and sub there if you haven't already and stick around the channel because Abs will be back. In the meantime, don't do anything that I would. Trust me on that because that will probably net you a late night visit from Yellow Ted and he will bring his bucket of soapy frogs and his wetsuit with the bottom cut out. So see you then. Ciao for now.